So we can, uh, we'll get started and people will linger or come in as they choose. So this is the designing and developing walkable urban groceries. And let me just go back and show you this slide, which I'm supposed to show you uh, if you want to get uh, AIA continuing education credit. And these are the learning objectives, which you're supposed to know about. Uh, and uh, so let me just begin by saying, uh, just to try to segue from uh, last evening's uh, presentation by Richard Florida, uh, you know, if, if we have robust cities where we bring out the full creativity of its inhabitants and create a walkable environment where people can live and, and really be immersed, um, clearly the grocery store is one of the essential, really the essential components of those communities. And, I think it's safe to say that up until about maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, the idea of being able to get an urban grocery store uh, was, pretty diff was pretty hard. Uh, it ain't so easy even today, but it's a lot more knowable today. Uh, but it was really imp impossible. And, uh, and so uh, the collected uh, work of 10 years uh, has taught us a number of things. Uh, and it has shown a lot of uh, national and regional uh, supermarket chains uh, that they could prosper and actually do, uh, do very good business. And at the same time, uh, we've learned a lot about how to, to make those work uh, and, and, and also seen some that, that haven't worked. Uh, so that's the, the, the idea of today's conversation. Um, two things as a way of uh, housekeeping. Uh, well, first of all, the, the speakers today are David Talby, uh, who is uh, with Public Supermarkets, who, if you, you're not from Florida, you may have seen their signs around here, but they are uh, probably the largest Florida chain, and, and, and uh, I think they were on the Consumer Reports ranking of supermarkets, you guys were like number three in the nation, which is awfully good because they're only really located here in Florida and Georgia and five states. Five sta okay, so not as good then. but. <laughs> Pretty good. I mean, they were right up there with Trader Joe's, so, you know, uh, and way above Whole Foods. So, uh, and uh, John Given with CIM Group, uh, which is a uh, uh, developer uh, doing development in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and providing capital uh, for projects in D.C. and I think in Florida, right? Or yeah. looked at it? Uh, and, New and New York. So, um, and myself, I'm Neil Payton uh, with Torty Gallus and Partners. We are architects and urban designers in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, and Los Angeles. Uh, so two things. One is, at, because this is a Congress, right, not just any old conference, uh, I was told we are supposed to come out of each session, although I don't know that this has happened in any sessions, with some kind of a statement, some kind of a what we affirm, or at least set of statements. Has anybody been in one of these sessions where you've done that? Well, actually, you should have been, because if you've gone to any sessions, this is supposed to have happened. You've done, okay, so, so we're going to, at the end of this, if you have, think of things that you want to list. I don't know how they're going to, we'll list them all, but, okay. The second thing is before we start, we, we have a, I, I like to do this where I start with questions, even though we haven't presented anything. Uh, so the whole idea is if you have, if you've come into this room with questions, I'd like to hear about them now, we'd like to hear about them now because maybe we can address some of them as we speak. So who has questions? Yes. I live in downtown Gainesville, Florida, and I know what I can do to get a public that can walk in distance to my house. Okay, so David just... I need an address. Yeah, he needs an address. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be looking. And he's going to Google Earth right now. Yes. Did you all hear that question? He wants to, he wants to know how he can get a, uh, a public supermarket by his house in Gainesville, Florida. Yeah. Not too close, though. Okay, so uh, question deals with uh, amount of parking, quantity of parking, and location of parking for a, grocery, a small footprint grocery store in an urban area. Anybody else with a question? Yes.
Yeah. Some of that's probably not, he's probably not going to tell you because I think some of that is stuff that they like to keep to themselves. But, you know, whatever you can share, we'd be happy to hear it. We'd all love to hear it. Yes. Excellent question. Did you hear that? Yes. Product mix and, and uh, uh, sort of any changes for smaller for formats? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How to get supermarkets in a food desert in a poor area. Yes, sir. <laughs> How to get you into Mississippi. Uh, I, there's, there's so many things I would like to say, but I won't. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, how to get financers to finance them. Yes. Um, basically, I'm in North Carolina. Do you want to compete with Harris Theater? <laughs> Does he want to compete with Harris Theater? Okay, well. Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Harris Theater has an, and we're, you're going to see a Harris Theater that we were in, did in, uh, the, outside of D.C., so they do them too. Um, yes, sir. Dealing with blank walls, and we're going to definitely talk about that. Yes, yes. What we sell, how does that relate to the design and to the production? Okay. Uh, what's that? All right, so this is a, a, probably a more fundamental and deeper question, uh, and certainly one that would be great to talk about. Uh, don't know if any of us are going to answer that, but, you know, which is what we sell and what the relationship is between these physical entities and, and, that, and that production of food and what that, what that connection is. And that's, a, uh, that's probably the last word on questions because nobody, <laughs> nobody can go beyond that one. That's question uh, uh, so and with that, I think, um, uh, let's um, turn it over to Dave. Uh, and you've got a lot of uh, questions to answer. Uh, and there's, a, right? Is this yours? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, let me just get to the set it up for you. Okay. Great. Everybody, hear me? Okay. Yeah. Terrific. There uh, we go. All right. Give you a little bit of background and uh, talk about how we're incorporating urban sites uh, into public's um, site selection. And we see this as a, as a really growing part of our business. And we're talking exponential growth. So 10 years ago, we were doing maybe one or two projects. And now I probably have 20 or 30 projects that are in different phases, and they keep coming. So this is very pertinent conversation for all of you. It's certainly for Publix and a lot of other grocery chains as well. Uh, and it's something we really need to work on because uh, it's, it's a challenging process. So we, we've learned a lot, and I'm here to share that and hopefully generate uh, more discussion and uh, maybe some more sharing from the audience too. Um, one of the critical things to us and probably to everyone else is proportion and dimension. And, and you're probably wondering, well, yeah, that's architecture. Um, give me some more than that. And what I'm really saying is, it's all about lot width and size and how that relates to our prototypical solution. So we're trying to figure out ways. And in the Publix, we have um, basically six different prototypes that we work with. We're trying to find ways to fit that box all right, on the site and then start working with it. And if the site is too narrow, too long, too, too, out, or too, too much of a morph of those prototypical shapes, then we can't really even start. And, and that's true of anybody. So if, if, if I was someone else up here from a different company, they would have the same parameters and have to be thinking about those. We don't have the flexibility of taking that prototype and just starting from scratch. There's way too much business study that's been invested in that prototype. Um, and like, that's kind of leads to my next point, which is all of these sites are carefully, or these, these prototypes are carefully adapted to the site. So we're kind of calculating how much change we can make to that particular store, that particular prototype, 
in order to still allow it to operate very efficiently and in sort of a predictable manner, but still fit within this urban context and be successful with, you know, satisfying those parameters. All right? And then, uh, you know, that's, that's really what we're talking about is preserving that business model because there's, there's a lot of time, money, um, and efficiency built into that, and we just don't have that luxury of, of making huge transitions and kind of like uh, starting the business over just because we're on a, uh, a, a unique piece of property. Um, what, what are these prototypical attributes that I'm talking about? Well, they're really talking about offering the least, um, offering in the least amount of floor area, the most amount of product, the most choices to our customer. Um, we're looking for a consistent customer and associate experience. So from an operations standpoint, um, as we move management from store to store to store, they're able to, to recognize what goes on in that store and operate it effectively and not have to start all over again. For our customer, it's finding product in the same place and going from one Publix to another and being able to get oriented easily. And it's also about profitability. You know, it's about the root basis of our business. So as, as we modify things, we have to think about what's critical in each one of those departments that still allows it to work. Sometimes I have flexibility in some areas, sometimes I don't. It just depends on the amount of change that we need to inflict. Um, it's always about efficient truck delivery. Uh, we're probably getting four, five, or more full 55-foot long semis to a store in a day. So unlike some places where you're, you're getting a truck every once in a while, we're getting trucks all the time. And it's all about moving that product from that truck out on the floor in the people's bags and they're taking it home. And if I've got really difficult truck access or too difficult of a working hour situation, I'm really straddled, really, really, really challenged. Um, workflow, customer-centric views of departments, um, uh, simplified orientation so they have really good wayfinding, being able to really look across the store, look across the landscape of the store and quickly find what you need, be able to understand the whole offering when you walk in the door. This is really where we start from, from this prototype. This one in particular is from Baldwin Park and I may refer to this later as we talk about uh, other ideas and things we can do. Here you can see uh, this is the front of the store, entry door, exit, offices, this is about 45,000 square feet, and it is 190 feet, I think, uh, front to back, and about 230 feet side to side. And uh, this is our loading dock. This loading dock normally is right here in the middle. We moved it over here on the side, and we'll kind of explain that in the series of photographs that are to follow. So here we are in Baldwin Park on the eastern side of downtown Orlando on an old Navy base. You probably, several people here are already familiar with this project. Wonderful wonderful community. Our particular store is right here with liner retail and residential on this side and around here and then surrounded with residential here all right on this side of that traditional parking lot right there. A little bit closer. Thank you Google Earth. All right. It kind of looks like the same old thing. But for us, this is way different. My store usually slopes from here, from the front to the back. This slopes opposite in order to allow this to happen. So minor change, really simple, right? Not complicated to think about. Docks on the side. Trucks are able to navigate through here. I understand the sensitivity of the pedestrian landscape. This isn't my favorite solution, but it was a solution that worked. And it was a way for us to get trucks in there efficiently and still provide something that, that has a reasonable appeal to it from the sidewalk. Here's some views from the parking lot, uh, kind of a traditional approach to, to our entry, um, maybe the illusion of windows, uh, extra windows in the front to open up, views in and out of the store. Um, here's our, our main entrance from, from a pedestrian street. The docks over here to the left. Here we are on the other side of the building where we're talking about, uh, where we had talked about liner shops and residential, and there's sort of a, a pedestrian park, and I can't remember if this is a coffee shop or what, but um, nice pedestrian scale. Um, no, no really clue that there's even a grocery store here. Um, from, from my standpoint, that's kind of problematic because there is no clue. There's no sign. 
no awareness at all. But, but for everyone who lives here, they obviously know where the grocery is. Um, we're the only grocery there. Kind of further working around the perimeter, um, here we are with some art. Um, here, not public art, but Publix art. And in this case, it's a solution to fenestration. So maybe it's creating something interesting for people to look at as they walk by. It's relating to our company. These are pictures of our founder. These are the historical pictures that have been um, illustrated and, and kind of fit into the, uh, the architecture of the, of the facade. All right? This is at the edge of our parking lot. These are residential units right across the street from our parking lot. And I think it was really successful in terms of, of how this is screened and the look and feel of this alleyway and how it relates to the store. This is right on the edge of the parking lot, um, parking along the side of the street, really effective landscaping. Uh, as you're walking through here, uh, you, you barely can see the cars. Um, you know, this is, this is really a great example of, of how that screening can work and, and still kind of work with our um, standard box. All right, and then just some more views, more views of the dock. Okay. I'll move on to our second store. And I, I'm really just showing a variety of things that we've done, just a kind of a cross section. And uh, maybe you'll have some questions about, you know, details. And we can get to those in the question and answer period. Here we are in Orlando again, Lake Eola, uh, real, course, real close to downtown Orlando, lots of high rise office, um, high rise residential nearby. Here's our store. Our store's right here on the corner, residential tower above us. Um, all sorts of uh, residential around, restaurants, shop, um, lower historical housing to the east, really dynamic community, public park. All right, here's a zoom in. You still can't tell our stores here because it's covered up with the residential tower and the rec deck. Um, but we're right here on the corner. All right, here's our entrance. Our store is really kind of tucked in back here. There's retail below on the first floor, speculative retail, along with office up above, residential up above that. All right. Here's a little alcove uh, that looks into the store. Um, and, and the proportion of all this fenestration is, is totally possible with this particular prototype. This is about a 28,000 square foot store. And where it's located, where the fenestration is located, works, works perfectly. Uh, we have makeshift. Um, uh, sandwich shops and things that show up in a lobby space. We have views into the check stands. Um, it's, it's, it's dynamic, and I think it's really what um, most codes are kind of looking for. Another view from down the street. Uh, this is the corner again, looking the other way. There's some signage, um, but kind of wondering why we're doing silver on silver. Um, another view from the park. So you're kind of approaching from the park, and here we are. Um, from that corner, and then here's how cars get in and out. All right, so the garage entrance is here. And if I had another shot and more time, I could show you a really interesting loading dock, but I didn't think anyone really would care too much. Um, but great integration, really dynamic um, ways of getting customers in and out. And here is, is probably the biggest thing that's um, of interest on in this project. What we're seeing here is that there's enough density in this area that our normal parking use, um, our normal parking count and ratio is actually less, okay? I'm still successful, I still have the right customer base, I'm still profitable, but I have, I'm not using all those stalls. So our normal five per thousand requirement isn't being utilized. Maybe it is on peak days, Christmas, Easter, etc. Maybe it is during those days, but during, the average week, we're not experiencing that. And, and really what I'm hoping to find later on is, is how do we measure that? How do we create a metric for that? How do we, how do we study that in advance and be able to predict it? So um, we, you know, we don't want to build expensive parking garages if we don't have to. At the same time, I don't want to turn away customers. Is parking, parking is actually, I don't know how I go backwards. Just push the arrow. Um, there? Yeah. Um, parking is actually below. The store, the edge of the store is right here. The slab is even, and then you drive down and you're parking underneath the store. 
There's an elevator that takes you, uh, two elevators that take you back to that corner entry, and that's how you service uh, customers down to the lower garage level. Just a view into the check stands. This was, alcove was kind of set back to create some relief. It also acts as a sunscreen, something that's really critical in a grocery environment. I've got product everywhere. Um, even if I, if I don't show it, retail will start putting it in there anyway. So uh, the sun comes in. We've got to really think about um, how we control that and what kind of potential damage it does. But here they've done a nice job of pretty much keeping it clean, and it really provides great views into uh, the check stands. All right, moving on. Number three, we're down uh, closer to Miami. We're in uh, Surfside. There's the ocean. All right, this is an older project. This is close to 10 years old. All right, uh, the other projects I was showing you are more like five, five years old uh, or less. Uh, so this is a little bit older. Here we've taken the store. All right, the store occupies the whole site. We're the only use here. There's no other retail, but the store is elevated. Um, the store is right on the sidewalk. It's on an old established street, all right? And uh, because of this and the potential for hurricanes, I need to get my product up off the ground. I can't take that risk. So, um, and I have a site that I can't park conventionally. So we're gonna park underneath, all right? So I have some regular kind of uncovered parking and then underneath I've got enough field to take care of my typical parking ratio, no problem. And on this end, I have a circulation element that provides people movers um, and an elevator back up to my store entrance in a very typical fashion. And here's what it looks like then from, in terms of a facade. So we're right on the corner. Um, the people movers are kind of migrating up this way at an angle to this common lobby that overlooks the street corner. Down below, uh, we have openings where uh, there's tables. It can be outdoor dining. People can bring uh, sandwiches and stuff down here and eat. And right here on this edge is a, uh, is a bus stop. And then there's a walkway um, here that kind of runs across. Let me get another view of this. Um, kind of horizontally over here that has steps and provides pedestrian access up to the store. The openings here. Uh, have awnings, uh, they're uh, open uh, grills, so sort of a mesh grill that kind of obscures a little bit of the view of the garage. It's still a garage, it's not a window, but it does, it complies with the building code, air requirements. Um, but at first glance, it really kind of feels um, like maybe, you know, like shops. Okay, and then finally, um, a more recent project, only a couple years old in Greenville. This is uh, McBee Station kind of uh, east of the downtown core. Um, our store here, parking, residential, all right? The residential also wrapping around the side. We'll get a little bit closer, all right? Parking at grade, and because of the contour of that particular site and its high point here and then falling down the hill this way, uh, we're able to fit another level of parking below. Over the years, we found that uh, our five per thousand ratio is really there for peak times. So um, it's only really used in peak times. Maybe it's peak of the week, maybe it's peak of a, of a particular season and throughout the year, but the rest of the time, you know, I would say half of this parking you know, or this whole deck is satisfactory for normal operation. And then what happens is associates and employees can park on the lower level, all right, and this is all here for customer and it's very convenient. So we're starting to learn more about that as we do more and more of these projects and we kind of observe what's happening. Uh, we're kind of seeing that our standard could maybe lessen a little bit and, and we can kind of adapt on how we, how we lay things out so we're not as worried about that parking count. All right, here's some views of the entry. Retail here, uh, kind of as a pavilion, residential adjacent. Um, our standard stores kind of broken down with shapes that relate to that kind of change the scale. Just some other views, looking up and down that street. Here's our, our parking next door. Views on the opposite side of the street with residential up above, and this is bordering the back side of our store or, or other uh, retail, um, retail below, but residential above. 
Okay, just more views looking out through parking. Um, that same corner. Uh, poor iPhone photography uh, that I did. Uh, but uh, there is a sign here. So unlike Baldwin, where we can't see the store, this sign wraps the corner of this tower. Um, doesn't seem to be confusing the people. Gives us some identity and uh, helps direct people around the site for navigation. And then here, um, this sort of a breakdown of forms, uh, some of the function that we need, and just ways of kind of, of screening that and making it relate to the building. And, and we've seen a lot of this. And, and the more and more we do, uh, the more and more we really realize that we really have to think about great ways of, of kind of covering this stuff up and still allowing it to function, still allowing trucks to come in, dealing with large compactors um, and, uh, and, and the actual unloading of the trucks. So I'm not really saying that this is a great example, but it was, it was a way of, of addressing that on this particular site. And with that, I am done. Just one second. Hi, um, I'm John Given, and I want to. Uh, what you're going to see here is is the challenges of putting the supermarket in a higher density uh, urban downtown condition. It, uh, I think that many of the issues there there are really matters of scalability of some of the same uh, issues that uh, David spoke about. Our company is uh, really uh, has, a, has a business model of investing only in urban districts uh, that have some fire under them and uh, multi multiple use. Uh, we're not product specific. We're not a grocery developer. Uh, we're not a residential developer purely. We, we really uh, are opportunistic within an urban district. Um, we have grown from performing our own development, uh, in some cases still to uh, being primarily an equity investor in real estate. So we have a pretty good idea of, and, and, and of you know, situations that work and situations that don't work. Uh, so I want to go through a project that was very near and dear to my heart because in 1980, uh, I started working as a uh, project planner for the redevelopment agency in this very same area of downtown LA called South Park. And uh, there was no plan at the time, but there was a uh, determination that there should be a community of 6,000 people there. Um, so 25 years later, we got it. <laughs> and. Uh, the amazing thing is, uh, is, at the end of the day, you're talking about something that's just a supermarket. And it fulfills an amazing array of aspects that humanize uh, and bind uh, uh, an evolving community together. Um, some of it's brick and mortar. Some of it's the people who stand in those you know, who work the store, who everybody in the community gets to know. Uh, and otherwise, the community would be a little sterile. Uh, it's, it's a store that keeps its lights on later into the night. And uh, these, are th these are things that, that uh, really, I think, we, 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 we seek when we set out to build new communities or to reinvest. So this is downtown, uh, the southern part of downtown LA. Downtown is a very large area that is bounded by freeways that go kind of like that. It's about uh, uh, a workforce of about 400,000 in that larger area. 
uh, all of every industry and government and uh, service possible. The financial district is uh, here, the Bunker Hill uh, residential district is over here, the little Tokyo residential district is over here, uh, sort of really successful and, and since this picture was taken, uh, burgeoning uh, kind of east side. Now, uh, market version of an artist district. Uh, Our office is in there too, by the way. A historic <laughs> uh, core of buildings. It's probably one of the largest collection of 1920 uh, high-rise or 12-story architecture in the in the uh, country on Broadway and Spring and Main and, and Hill Broadway, Spring and Main. Uh, that uh, is is largely intact, but it was dead. And then a, an ordinance was passed that allowed uh, reuse of buildings without having to get variances from planning codes, which raised the question of why do we have setbacks and density and why do we worry about a lot of the things when it seems to work without. Um, anyway, this area of South Park is, the, is sort of the new ground up residential area. It did, it did have, when I was working there, a lot of, small, a lot of uh, little uh, SRO buildings. There's probably a couple thousand people living there. And over time, uh, we, we sought to keep them, but uh, the absence of the residential market and the opportunity of other projects uh, started to push them out. Uh, Staples Center is right here. Uh, LA Live, which if you're watching the any, any game, hockey, Clippers or Lakers, uh, is right there and it's always in the pictures. Um, 7th Street, where the Metro station uh, is located, and Flower Street, a light rail station that connects both to west side LA now and south to Long Beach. So then, years passed, uh, when I was there in the 80s, we, we got started on a, a little cluster of residential fashion institute of design and a park. This three block area was a, an assembly of the gas company that uh, had uh, sat vacant, except for their office buildings, uh, until they moved out in 1990. And then from, it was purchased by a Japanese bank and they held it for 10 years and did nothing. And we and my company uh, ended up acquiring it. Uh, but the challenge had always been, how do you bridge this, these long blocks from South Park into downtown? So I get a call saying, uh, you know, we're looking at this site that's at 9th and Flower. What do you know about it? I just about dropped. Uh, so we're talking about a tremendous uh, kind of change that's starting to happen in downtown. A lot of what you're seeing in the, in the uh, pipeline and under development is in that adaptive reuse uh, category. And then, uh, more re and then in the, in the uh, plan check under consideration is, is new construction largely in South Park and Little Tokyo area. At that time, when you surveyed the folks who live downtown, that's probably about 6,000 market rate, probably including affordable seniors, et cetera, probably uh, 10 or 12,000. Uh, you see that just about everybody shopped and did their major shopping somewhere greater than five miles away from downtown LA. They went to Pasadena, they went to Hancock Park, they went to various uh, areas. Um, back when I was planning for this neighborhood, we, we located a market, we, or we said this is where a market ought to be, and we had, our, we, we had a, some sense that there was a challenge of getting a project built in, at that point. But we figured there'd be this organic uh, kind of evolution of small, smaller grocers, smaller purveyors, uh, which didn't happen. 
And what was very interesting is that our culture has evolved and it's evolving again. But regardless of which of those neighborhoods in downtown you lived in, and regardless of the demographic that was in those areas, people were going outside of downtown to shop. Um, I'm a big believer that cities are changing because household composition is changing and is so radically diversified that the product that the, that the business is, the business is and the developers and is changing so it is changing and so we are starting to see a lot of, uh, of things that in 1980 when we did this work becomes a little bit more possible uh, now unfortunately this kind of stuff takes a long time um, and uh, especially in California this adaptive reuse ordinance was the was the kicker. Then Staples, the cathedral was at least uh, an important, and Disney Hall were important uh, markers. We came into downtown in late 2000, uh, entered in, the, the redevelopment agency is, was at its, uh, had its last $7 million for the Central Business District uh, project, and they still didn't have a market and they decided that's what they would use it for. We entered into an agreement to to deliver that. Uh, went through about a year and a half of, of a DDA and uh, environmental impact and entitlement. Um, none of which uh, broke any new ground because density is far greater than what we planned for the site had been evaluated probably four times over the last ten years before that. Um, but during that period of time, there's, if you all recall from about 2002 to around 2007, we experienced a tremendous escalation of, of construction cost, which was very challenging. We started negotiating with the supermarkets, ended up into a, in a lease with Ralph's for a 50,000-foot uh, store. This store is absolutely standard in every dimension possible uh, and in every service provided possible in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the way David described, described that. Um, finally, we opened 2007 and by about that time we were up to 44,000 uh, units uh, that you could count on. This goes back to 1982, um, kind of a, a framework plan for how we might expect downtown to develop. This is the park that did get developed. This is the blocks that were the market should have, was, is now. This was a perspective. We were, we were looking at putting the market down here in our planning. It, the opportunity arose here. Now watch the change. Um, the real neighborhood is not LA Live. LA Live is, is something about a regional uh, entertainment center, uh, but the investment was meaningful to other investors and all of this area has become a neighborhood of around 6,000 households. So we go into the site, which is right there, seven acres, and we master planned it for about 1,200 housing units, 125,000 feet of retail, uh, taking advantage of one existing parking structure. Um, First phase was an adaptive reuse of 500,000 feet of gas company corporate office space. The rest is all new construction. After looking at the site, when we first walked in in 2000, 2001, and talked to the redevelopment agency about getting a market, the only footprint that seemed to work was in this area, because we knew we would have to meet the standards of 
Albertsons, Ralphs, whoever was going to step forward. So we planned a project that would be residential above a supermarket. We kind of called that diagram the missing tooth, separating South Park from the financial district. Um, adapted reuse. We converted the upper 10 floors of a 22-story office building to residential and moved the office to the lower floors. Um, this will be starting construction uh, in a few months. This was built out, two towers here, tower to remain here, market lofts above the market here, and a parking structure serving all the various uses there. It's the market lofts. Um, and this is the finished product of the uh, market lofts above the market. Um, it, it, and you can see both uh, the uh, layout and condition of that. We'll get back a little bit more into layout. The residents of the lofts here park in a freestanding parking structure developed behind it. The plan of the structure evolved over time from this drawing. Uh, I won't go into that. So site plan, um, entrance on 9th Street, a one-way street coming into town. Uh, Flower is one way south. Hope Street is, two, is uh, in and out, is, is north-south uh, lanes. We had to deal with uh, loading. Um, we had to deal with uh, trash compactor. We had to provide space for residential uh, loading and unloading, move, move in and move out. Because of the requirements of the market, the entry lobby is, is pushed into the, the corner of the site uh, so that all of your circulate, you'll see how the circulation is, is therefore affected. It was important to us to, in every way possible, create liner, and you'll see how a liner eventually got in on, on both sides. Here's the, so the parking for the market is entered off of either street. It goes down and one level under. There's 127 parking spaces and a lobby that then goes straight up into the market. That's a little over two per thousand. And uh, to my, uh, and I was amazed when they accepted that. I mean, we had other parking nearby, uh, uh, and uh, but it was accepted. And the reality is, I don't know. I haven't heard of, and I haven't ever seen it when I've been in there. A time when that parking structure has been uh, full, but there's business like crazy every day. It's the, one of the highest producing uh, Ralphs in the entire region, if not in the top five. Because um, people shop every day when you live in a city. Here, then we started getting some liner re retail. And part of what set that up is we had to keep this column bay plan to meet the merchandising uh, standards that David was talking about which meant that we couldn't drop shear walls from the building, a six-story concrete building above it into that space. So shear walls drop here, which left these little 20-foot deep uh, areas that we were able to lease. We were able to put a little load on these columns, but not to make them too big. And you can see then how, how that uh, layout services a very familiar plan uh, of a grocery store. You know, the, the produce is over here, the prepared foods are here. This store amazingly has its own wine cellar and um, um, Wine and beer and alcohol is, are, is a real big seller in downtown <laughs> markets. Probably why they're one of the most profitable. It's definitely, yeah. 
And there, there's actually a sommelier who, who runs the wine, wine cellar there. Yeah. That's downtown LA, which nobody would have imagined right. would happen. So here's the, again, a recap of the time frame. Um, the, in the yellow uh, is Jeff Kreshek's family history that occurred during that time. He was our, uh, in charge of our leasing. And um, the finished Ralphs set in uh, a rendered model of the overall South, what we called South Village uh, in downtown. We opened uh, to great celebration. Um, it, was, it was really quite an amazing event because literally from the day before to the day after, it's as if central casting was brought out and they just stayed. Because there had been housing units in the area, but there was no reason to go out on the street. Right. And people were now coming from, fruit, from markets over Broadway and Spring, four, five, six blocks away. Coming from Bunker Hill, four, five, six blocks to the north. Coming by the dash bus. And it was and it continues, just continues. When I, when we, before we opened, I went in and with the Ralph's uh, folks, we spoke to the employees before the mayor's thing. And I thought, what caught me, it was, it was something that occurred to me just as I was there, but that these employees, and I, I told them this, that this, this is, you guys are the ones who are going to keep the lights on. You're the ones who are going to know everybody. This is your neighborhood and it's yours to, to make it successful. And I really, truly believe, believe that. And, and I'm talking, where I'm going with this is the, the, the quality of business, the success of business, the quality of businesses that you allow into your districts are very, very important and can often overcome some of the worst barriers to um, you know, good design or good planning or whatever kinds of errors and mistakes uh, might, might get made through the course of 25, 30 years. Mayor cutting the ribbon, our congresswoman, um, and here's the site before. Wow. And the site looking up Flower Street after. This building was our, was our most troubled building. Uh, it ended up getting thrown into the historic designation, uh, which I wish it hadn't. But um, so we. It was, a very, it was like a cold storage building, but that's where the gas company in 1952 thought the most modern way of housing you know, their office workers would be. Uh, so these little tiny windows is the only light it had. And it's a, nine, it's a huge floor plate, like 20,000 foot floor plate. And so we, what we did is we built another structure on the other side that is the ramp and then use the upper floors of this building uh, entirely for parking, to, to get parking uh, in there. Wow. It was not inexpensive. So kind of a composite of, of the process and the, and the uh, outcome. And so for us, uh, and being uh, an investor, I will ad admit that uh, the development cost far exceeded expectations. That $7 million that the redevelopment agency had set aside was basically a land write down for an otherwise freestanding uh, supermarket with a, with a, or maybe a write down for, 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 for what it would have taken to bring in a Publix in that scale, at that density of, of parking. Um, we didn't fully understand that at the time but it was all we could get, and we tried to make all these other things happen. Uh, that store has, has continued to outperform all expectations on the order of probably four times 
the underwriting that Ralph's was, was, was undertaking at the time that we entered into the lease. Part of that's good negotiation on that part. Part of it is literally the change. They up, continuously upgraded their store while it was in planning and development and, and during the time of construction. And they, because they saw the change coming, they, they turned it into basically a Whole Foods with bright lights. Um, I've mentioned before, two per thousand seemed to work. Uh, turn the lights on. And I guess I struggle with, um, I'm a city planner by training for the last 15 years. I've been in develop, investment and development. Um, and I've always worked on economic development and, and, and sort of transformational areas that need to change. Um, and I've, I've struggled with, and I, I challenge you to think about the prescriptive versus the transactive approach to getting something done. Prescriptive meaning we want it there and we think it will look, fit this footprint. Now we go out and find who will shake their head and nod at that, or do we be transactive and take the opportunities as they come and, and make them work? Um, a successful business model and program versus the site. How do you reconcile those two issues? The chicken and egg from the standpoint of at what point can you get a market in there? Um, that may, this, the chicken was time, changing demographics, uh, uh, increased households in downtown. The egg was the supermarket. I don't think we could have beaten that and accomplished that anyway. We couldn't, as a redevelopment agency, couldn't build a market. I mean, I think it wouldn't make sense even if, if, if you built a market and turned it over to Publix and there's no, they can't get the sales, it's, it's not going to make it. So um, finally, the mixed use uh, vertical versus horizontal. We struggled with cost to build this thing. We weren't hitting pro forma until the condo market just caught up with us a little bit because we were looking at apartments. I would say in hindsight, to get this moving faster, I would have looked at building a freestanding store with, with parking above or below and thrown the density to the adjacent properties. Well, I, um, thank you, John. I, 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 having our office uh, downtown in LA, I can uh, attest to the transformational aspect of that store. Uh, in fact, now there's another grocery store that's potentially coming into the market, which I don't think they would have ever come had they not seen the experience of, of the Ralphs being successful. It's just, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna go and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, some of the issues and challenges uh, Actually, this, you're going to see this project several times. Uh, my partner, Brian O'Looney, uh, who's actually sitting, raise your hand, is the, was the principal in charge of this project. Uh, so if you have any questions about it, he probably knows more than I do. Um, but uh, just uh, briefly, uh, this is one that uh, you might have seen if you saw the design awards uh, uh, this year. I'm going to explain it a little bit further, but it was essentially the site of a Safeway. Uh, in Upper Georgetown, uh, a pretty seriously good market to begin with. The Safeway, originally it was known as the Social Safeway. There was a built-in market already. It was called the Social Safeway because this was commonly thought to be the place that if you didn't have a date on a Friday night, you went to to get a date. And you would stand over the cantaloupes and, and inquire as to whether the person thought it was, they were ripe or not. Um, <laughs> the, um, Another one we'll talk about a little bit is uh, Sherlington Village. This is a mixed-use uh, area uh, in uh, Arlington County, Virginia. The extension of uh, an existing kind of what might have been called a lifestyle center when Federal Realty first developed it, uh, added to uh, with a 20,000 square foot Harris Teeter store uh, with uh, apartments above adjacent to uh, a new library uh, for the county. Uh, also a project, uh, we're going to go into these a little bit more detail in a second, uh, City Vista, also in downtown Washington. In this case, 
with a mix of both apartments and condos above a Safeway and various other things. Uh, and, um, and that was a CIM. And that was, oh gosh, how could I not mention that? CIM and that was finance and a CIM financed project uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so let me just um, talk a little bit about some of the differences that we've noted between designing, let's call it a conventional grocery store, and one that is uh, 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 an urban grocery. Uh, and, and we've heard about the, the footprint itself. Uh, we've, we've, uh, the, just the, the, this is a Swiss watch, one of these urban grocery stores. There's stuff coming in and coming out, people coming up and down. It's all over the place. And so the, the flow of humans and, and stuff in and out is just a much more intricate kind of balance. Uh, the, you heard about service. You still have to get trucks in and out of these places. In some cases, when they're in a very urban situation, even more so, because some cities have limits on the kinds of sizes of trucks they can bring in uh, and the like, so you're actually bringing in more trucks, smaller but more of them, more frequently. Uh, and so that, um, and historically, um, there's the issue of brand identity. And so typically, these supermarkets are used to, you know, the sign, the big sign that says Publix or whatever. Um, and so these are all kind of challenges. Add to that, uh, John mentioned the column grid issue, and believe it or not, these supermarkets, they don't all have the same column grid, because you see Safeway has figured out something slightly differently than Publix has. And those are very closely guarded, uh, and it's part of how they maximize their efficiency, their profits, but they're not the same. Um, you know, where does the plumbing come from if you have a mixed-use project uh, that, uh, that John spoke about, particularly apartments or condos? You know, you got a lot of plumbing that has to come down and go somewhere. You got to get trash chutes down. You got to get exit stairs down. And you can't have them exiting in the middle of your supermarket, right? Uh, you've got to get ventilation up from the garage. You got to get ventilation up from the store itself. You've got a, you know, the service bays, the parking, the lobbies. If you've got a house, you've got housing above a grocery store, you have to have a lobby for that housing somewhere. That's not going to disrupt, the, again, the operation. And then, of course, the normal things like cashiers. And then somebody asked about how you get the wall to not be solid. Big issue, particularly in, a, in an urban location where you don't have a back of house like you have in a typical strip retail or even side of house. Um, so I mentioned this issue, the, 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 you know, one of the reasons they cost more is because of the, of the transfer beams that you're going to wind up using to make these things work. Because in the end, that's what's going to happen, right? And so this just costs more money to develop. I say that not to be a downer, but you just have to factor that in. I mean, you just can't be glib about this stuff. When people say, oh, well, just, you know, just do mixed juice. I mean, they do it everywhere. Well, okay, but the, the market has to be able to support a building a building that's going to cost as much as it does in, in terms of the returns it's going to get. You just have to know that it can. Um, one of the ways to do that is to try to avoid stacking the housing above the grocery as much as possible, believe it or not. So in a case like uh, this project at City Vista that we just talked about, a lot of the residential is actually stopped, stacked on the liner retail that surrounds it. A lot of it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So that helps a lot because it, you've got a lot more flexibility on that line of retail. If you can make that work, great. Um, exit stair locations. So here again, uh, getting them as much as possible in the corner. This is a project we've got uh, in design, uh, also in DC. Uh, getting the, the exit, where's the little, so the, the exit, uh, so you see it's a, essentially a, a courtyard or a, sort of a donut building. Right, you've got exit stairs over there and over there, so they're kind of in the corner, out of the way of the, of the actual operation of the, of the grocery itself. Um, you know, being able to do things like hide the ventilation, either through kind of a, a second or a third or an interstitial floor, where you can literally turn the ducts and get it out the side, or come up through kind of things like that on the courtyard that then have ducts or ventilation stacks coming out of that, but you can't see it because it's a little bit higher than the... So these are kind of things you have to do to get that stuff out of there. Um, uh, sometimes it's coming out, you know, underneath things and the like. Um, and just more of that, you see. Little, there's some ventilation coming out of there. The um, service bays. So this is the... Um, we, we talked about... The, the Georgetown Safeway is kind of interesting and a little counterintuitive, a lot like the Publix. 
Uh, it, uh, a lot like the Publix, I see. Uh, it has, um, the grocery is actually on the second floor. I got, got you already. I heard it, saw it. Um, grocery is on the second floor, which is totally counterintuitive to anything I would have ever expected. It turns out that what Safeway says is, you know what's really important to them, and I don't know how Publix feels, what's really important is where you actually, the car enters. Once they get you parked your car, because they're still thinking about that, they can get you into the store. So in this case, the Safeway itself is on the second floor. There's liner retail here, which essentially covers all the parking that's underneath. And then further out uh, in the back, there's, a, there's an actually a, a ramp that slowly ascends the site uh, to the back. Uh, in this case, the service bays, like we've seen in others, are in effect uh, down an alley. That is right here. There are service bays for the grocery. There are service bays for the rental and for the condo. Uh, so you see that uh, there. The actual uh, parking, and there's two entrances to the parking, like there was at, at, at the Ralph's. One for the grocery, one for the housing, because they're different. And the people who live in the housing expect to find a, a parking space. And this is in downtown Washington. They still, you, they still some people have cars. Uh, and so being able to sort that and then make it very clear where the entrance to the actual store is once you've parked the car, right? Or in this case, the parking again, you drive by, and then the parking is in the back. This is the, um, the, um, the Harris Teeter at Sherlington that I showed you earlier. The building lobbies. Again, uh, in the case of the Harris Teeter, you come through underneath, you enter the building lobby uh, right there if you're going up. Or at City, at City Vista, essentially two different lobbies, one for the condos, one for the rentals. Uh, again, missing the store entirely right or in two corners cashier locations big deal conventional footprint but behind all that now what this does right here it is again in George in the Georgetown one on the side all right because you know people come in through there right leave how that sorts out where it's located becomes important in this case they face some windows in this case they're actually against the solid wall which is great for the Safeway and they're up against the liner retail and the reason that that's important, actually, here's the Baldwin Park. I'm going to skip that because of time and move back to this. The reason that's important is because it has an effect on this issue of the facade and on the sort of transparency issue. Really, ideally, the, less, the more you can bury that grocery store, the better. Because the bottom line, bottom line is they don't like to have windows. They really don't. They want to use that space. And even if they wanted to display stuff, Apparently, when the sun beats in and, and the vegetables are all displayed, it's not such a good thing for the longevity of the vegetables. So, you know, if you can bury it, so in City Vista, only this much of the, of the actual store is, is seeable, uh, important. And in the case of the Georgetown Safeway, only this much is really on the ground floor. Uh, this is the Harris Teeter, and this is the new one in Petworth, again, corners. Uh, where you do have the transparency, make the, you know, you got to have the counters at a lower height so you can see through. You see the vegetables or you see the, the coffee shop, which we just saw. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's it. To kind of race through because we have like six more minutes. So, uh, but hopefully we have a little bit of time either for some comments that you want to make in terms of the, like, um, statements that this ought to come out with, you know, the Congress part, or just questions. Yes, ma'am. So, you talk about grocery being a part of the community. Is there a point where you could start out with a certain size of grocery and then eventually build out when the actual community comes in and grocery Did you all hear that question? It's very interesting. Could you actually, in a sense, start with a small grocery and, in effect, build it out as the community got larger? What, what do you think about that? The Publix, could you ever imagine doing something like that? You know, sort of, exp you know, starting with a small store it's, and expanding it? It's an interesting concept. I don't know of anyone who's doing it. We inadvertently do it when we have, when we have um, stores that are starting to perform better and better, we will consider expansions. But it's a great concept to think about in terms of an emerging community. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yes. I I'll just give you. Uh, he said a grocery. <laughs> I'll just give Which you one, actually, one other uh, story about that. Uh, I was in a similar presentation, and, and there was a company 
based in Arizona, which is a land development company that also owns their own market chain. So in that one instance, they put the store in as the amenity for the first phase of homes. They were losing money terribly, but it was a, an amenity for a master plan community. Yeah, and we've done the same. By the way, Whole Foods claims that they provide a 10% premium to the housing above. I, 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 I'm Safeway claims a premium as well, but they didn't give me a number. So, yes. No, I recognize exactly what the gentleman pointed out, in case you didn't hear him, the difficulty of expanding, expanding an ongoing operation in a grocery store. No, no question that is difficult. But I think it's an interesting concept if you could figure out another way. By the way, there was an earlier question in the beginning about how you get, you know, produce or groceries into underserved locations. And I will say that we didn't cover that, but my experience so far in Los Angeles has been uh, and a number of other cities has been that there are a number of other chains out there that are actually very much all about the 15,000 square foot store, in many cases actually see their target market as, um, what's the chain in LA that's right. fresh, and e fresh and Easy, which is actually Tesco out of London. Uh, there's another German company that's been uh, in, the, in the Texas area, Aldi. That, so, I mean, I, I do think that there's another set of, 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 of operation. We, we're also looking at a grocery store has a community benefit in terms of uh, satisfying, you know, entitlement issues. So, any other comments and questions? Yes. It, it, it all depends on the store volume. So yes, uh, product mix does change. It relates to the basket. The baskets can be smaller. In a lot of cases there are. They're more frequent. What you commented on, Neil, in terms of urban grocery, I mean, people are going to shop just like they do in any city. They're going to be going there three or four times a week, if not every day. So it's something to consider, but it's all based on that density. And I think, I suspect that if you could uh, if the stores really took some time to look at it, the store that is, in a, is serving a family, a, a large, you know, sort of standard size homes, is going to have to have the full range of product. I suspect that if Ralph's was to go back and evaluate, the, you know, where they were profitable and where they had sales, maybe their dry goods was a little more than they needed. But I, I'm, that's just a speculation on my part. I may be totally yeah, you're, wrong. You're, you're, you're on to it. I mean, I think, I think for the most part, I think the research shows that it's very difficult to shop a very small format store your whole life. So you inevitably have to make a trip somewhere else to get that additional product mix that's not available at the small store. So it's an, you know, it's an interesting concept, an interesting way to go to market, but inevitably, there, you know, your life entails having to have that other product, uh, and, and that's where the challenge is. Does anybody have any suggestions for, um, you know, a statement or a, uh, a um, proclamation? What's that? I know. I think that's that is good. Grocery. Yeah, I, I love that one. Okay, it's going to be a meme. Uh, any other um, any other questions or comments? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, there there is, and and I can't talk about some of that with with you know with everyone here, but but it ranges, and we talked about this at lunch. We talked about it before this meeting as well. Um, it's all depending upon business models. So yes, there is a critical, but I'll tell you what, there's also some new findings that need to be done, and I think a lot of the people are trying to capture that. And how is the city, how is an urban setting different 
and, and maybe there's a whole different way that people perceive that store, and they don't necessarily have to be living right next door. Maybe they're working next door, and they're stopping there before they go home, and that's something that really needs to be looked at in the future. Okay, so this is, gentleman here is going to be the last. Just a oh, brief answer to that. In 19, in, in 2000, 2003, when we were negotiating, uh, there was a standard that we were up against. We had to prove that during, at the, at the point of opening, there would be 6,000 rooftops in, inside the downtown area, rooftops meaning households. Uh, none the, not, not including affordable, had to be market rate, and which was a mystery to me, but it, that was the standard. And you had 400,000, a workforce of 400,000 in a one to two mile area. The gentleman in the purple shirt will be the last question. So the question was, given how well some of these stores do, are any of the chains that any of us have worked for, or the chain, is, is, are considering small format stores also? And I know you guys, you guys have some small format stores. You may not like the answer, but Walmart and Target are downsizing to 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> but Bob, yeah. you have some small I mean, our, our current range right now is about 28,000 to 61,000. But just here in City Place, that store is probably 23, OK? And I, I, it's something to look at. I, I can't, I, we haven't seriously looked at it, but, but as this, this develops further, I think it's something that, that people will test that limit. Well, but there are stores that are. I mean, Fresh and Easy is, in, is at 15,000. Yes. Trader Joe's has typically been in older buildings, and they've adjusted whatever to whatever they got. And, and they've been in that, that range as well. So it, Whole Foods had gone up, and now is coming back down again. Uh, so, uh, you know, because they were sort of beyond where they should have been. So I, I think either, well, they all have different models. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, we have to, I think I, I was, there were some very aggressive people holding up signs that say zero minutes. So, um, <laughs> I think I have to like call it a quit, but if anybody has questions, I'm sure they'll, they'll be around. And so thank you all for coming. <laughs>